Order. Call the meeting to order. Meeting come to order. Ask for the flag salute. Flag salute. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and, and, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, and it is all with liberty and justice for all. Does anybody else want to, want to say like amen? Yes, and I'm just going to say that. Just me. <laughs> Roll call. Oh, do I have to do that? I'll do it. I'll do it. Uh, let's see. Chair Barisi is excused. Uh, Vice Chair Irons is absent. And that may be a communication glitch. I just want to say that. So, Commissioner Layton here. Commissioner Carbray here. Commissioner Connell here. Commissioner Jones here. Commissioner Tenike here. All right, and we do have a forum. Cool. So now approval of minutes. No. Yeah. Yes. So they are included, and again, this is a different kind of minute um, than we've done in the past uh, because the city retains the recordings of these minute of this of these meetings. Um, we do not have to uh, retain the entire. Uh, we don't have the we don't have to take detailed minutes. So these are what are called action minutes. So it's it literally lists what what the action was. The important piece is it has a time stamp. So it tells you for each of these items, like approval of minutes, it happened at sign timestamp 142. So if you went back to the meeting on the website and watched the YouTube video that's placed there, you could scroll forward to 142 and you could see that action happen. So that's the intent of the action minutes is not to provide a detail of what happened, but to kind of guide you to where it is on the recording. So, but it does capture the motions that are made and it captures the important part. So like under the public hearings, you'll notice where we identify the, the, the testimony uh, or, or kind, of, kind of generally what happened and then the motion that occurred um, again for each of those action items. Um, and then again, under discussion items, it provides a very short summary. Um, so what would have probably been with everything we went through that night, what probably would have been minutes that might have been eight, nine, 10 pages long to capture the conversation, particularly the staff report, it ends up being three pages. So I just want you to understand the difference of what you used to see and what you're seeing now. Yep. Okay. So, Am I supposed to read those? No. Okay. You can just simply, I, you know, and I don't know how many of you had a chance to read them. I don't know if you want to take just a moment and just run through them to approve them. Um, <coughs> we had a so moved from Commissioner Jones. Second. Second from Ragna. Which means, Mike, whenever you're ready, you can call for the question and we can take a roll call. Okay. So we already had the roll call. We just need to no. we need a roll call. We, we, we need a roll call to approve oh, the minutes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Roll call to approve the minutes. Okay, we'll do that. Commissioner Layton. Yes. Commissioner Carberry? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Tenai? Yes. And uh, we'll call you Acting Chair Connell tonight. Yes. Okay. So, what are we at? Discussion. Discussion items. Yeah. So, planning official report. Um, no, go back to your front page agenda. Exactly. Yes. A. Yes. Yes. Oh, right here? 5A. 5A. Okay. Oh, Any doctor guide the land use permit? Or land use planning, I'm sorry. So last meeting, a couple of you guys asked for tonight to be training. And so I thought about this and you've actually received this. If you've got the binder, you've got this document previously. So now you've got it a second time. Last time we really didn't get into it. I thought tonight we'd maybe get into it a little bit more. I think, I think what we probably want to touch on is kind of roles and responsibilities. You know, what's our job? What's your job? What's the city council's job? You know, kind of have an understanding of that. Maybe have a little bit of an understanding of how how things move through the system. Why do things come here? Why do things not come here? 
what things come here and then go to council, you know, just kind of highlight and touch on some of that. Some of you that have been doing this a little longer probably have a better sense of that. Those of you are that are new might be really helpful. So that's kind of what I thought I would attempt to do. I will say this, this guide, um, this guide to land use planning, is probably one of the better documents. Sadly, it's not been updated. It's from 2000 and either five or seven, so, so, yeah. but you know, it still has a, real, a lot of really good information. It's still relevant in a lot of ways. Um, so again, I'm, my intent is not, I'm not gonna touch on everything here, but I, I wanted to touch on those things that I think are important. Um, um, before I get too far into this though, I just wanna reiterate, this is Stephanie. She's our new principal planner. She did planning at the county for 10 years. So she's got a pretty good handle on process too. too. Um, like me, she's going to have kind of a learning curve with figuring out how it's different to do urban planning than rural planning because there are some significant differences. And then I also want to share that Nancy has submitted her resignation and is taking a lateral transfer to the city of Umatilla. Mm -hmm. So we will be recruiting for both a planner one and a planner two. We'll fit what we'll, we'll, we're recruiting for a planner one and or a planner two will fill one of those positions based on the qualifications of the applicant that's selected. Um, so if you know anybody who has a desire to do this kind of work, who has good customer service skills and has good computer skills, please encourage them to apply when it gets posted publicly. We have to go through an internal posting first. I'm not anticipating any internal requests, I'm not saying they won't happen, which could potentially end the process. Um, but if not, then it'll get posted and go public. And so we do need to fill that position. It's it's a critical job. Um, so what is the salary for that kind of position? Planner one. I just looked at that. Planner one starts at 55 and planner two starts at 60. Pretty close to that. Okay. Yeah. And no degree required? So for... For the planner one, which is the entry level position, really no. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd like to get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got a master's, Steph's got her bachelor's. Mm -hmm. um, for the planner two, we're kind of seeking somebody who maybe has an associate's degree and has a desire. Um, but I will tell you right now, finding planners anywhere is next to impossible. For it, it, Eastern Oregon, it, if you're not home, home growing them, you're not going to have one. I mean, it's just really hard to find a planner or everything. And that's why I say, if you know somebody that really has good customer service skills and can use a computer, Steph and I can teach them the planning side. So, yeah. I mean, if you ever looking for, you know, for a change, I'm just saying, <laughs> don't want to sound like don't it. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, back to this. Um, so, I, we've talked about some of this before. I'm going to kind of leapfrog through here a little bit. Um, we've talked about the goals in the, the in the past. And so there are 19 statewide planning goals. We have to account for 14 of them. In reality, only 12 of them, because two of those state truly statewide planning goals, one is for farmland and one is for forest land. And we don't have farm or forest land inside the city limits. So we don't deal a lot with goal three and goal four. And then goals... 15 through 19, four of those are coastal goals, meaning Pacific Ocean coastal goals. And then one is a Willamette goal um, for the Willamette Greenway. So the, the issues um, along and adjacent to um, the Willamette River and in that, in that part of the state. So we really deal with 12 goals. Um, goal one is citizen involvement. You guys serve as a citizen's advisory committee. Goal two, goal two is really the how do you plan goal? Again, three and four are farm and forest. We obviously don't deal with that inside the city limits. Goal five is the natural resources goal. I had an interesting conversation with a planning consultant the other day, and it's like cities really don't use really don't do much with goal five because usually within cities with the built environment, you don't have a lot of uh, natural resources. Um, the exception could be wetlands, um, but we really don't have a large wetland inventory here. Um, and then goal six is the water, air, and land quality goal. And again, we're striving for good, clean water, um, clean air, good soil, 
um, that is somewhat an urban goal. It is also more of an, a rural goal. So we deal with it, but not at the same level that you would in a, in a more rural environment. Goal seven is the natural hazards goal. Again, cities, depending on where you are, might have different levels of that in the county. Uh, here in Royal County, um, flood, flood issues um, are, are a really big natural hazard that we deal with. We don't here in Boardman. We really don't have a lot of floodplain. Um, but we could be impacted by wildfire. We could certainly be impacted by winter storm. There's about 10 things that are addressed in the county's natural hazards mitigation plan. Um, we are coming to the end of the current update that they're working on. Um, so hopefully we'll see that get wrapped up pretty soon that the city will adopt it. Um, it'll probably come through planning commission to the council to adopt as a guidance document. Um, and the city will have an annex in that and it will address the, the natural hazards that we're concerned about. Goal eight is a recreation goal. Ours is a pretty light, currently our comprehensive plan. There's not in, a lot in there, but we are getting ready to kick off the parks master plan. Um, and that will better inform our recreational component, but we're gonna have other things that we're gonna talk about relative to recreational needs. Nine is our economic goal. We're in the process of doing an economic opportunities analysis um, with a look towards um, employment lands. Do we have enough? And if we don't have enough, what do we need? Where And then where, where would be the best place to add new lands for that purpose? So we'll end up doing an urban growth boundary expansion on that particular front sometime in the next year, year and a half, maybe sooner. Uh, goal 10 is a housing goal. So we're doing a lot around housing. Um, we just had a big housing summit a week ago Tuesday. Um, and we're going to hopefully do a housing needs analysis sometime over the next year and a half. Um, the states and doing all kinds of rulemaking and they're kind of slowing us down at this point in time, but hopefully we get past that and can get moving. Um, goal 11 is our public services goal. So that's really issues from water and wastewater delivery, but other utilities that we coordinate with providers, um, our fire and police services, schools actually fall under public services. Um, so that that goal is an interesting uh, the library. And there's another number of things that you can look at under goal 11 for public services. Goal 12 is the transportation goal. So we're getting ready to kick off our TSP update, um, which reminds me, I have a question for you all before you leave tonight on that front. Um, so that that process will take about 12, 15 months to update our TSP. Um, that's goal 12. We'll have better inform that goal. Goal 13 is the energy goal. And when the goals were established in Oregon, it was the 1970s. And I, some of you are, some of you will remember the gas lines from the 1970s. Some of you are too young to remember the gas lines from the 1970s, but I remember them. So when they wrote the goals and they and energy was one of the goals, it, the focus of the goal is on energy conservation. But a lot of counties, and Morrill County was one of them. When they wrote that goal, and Boardman kind of mimicked that for our comprehensive plan, we talked more about energy production and consumption and transmission. Um, and there's been a real push for the state to look at energy from, it's great to look at from a conservation perspective, but there's other ways you could look at the energy goal. I'm hoping the state will eventually get there, um, but only time will tell on that. And the goal 14 is probably one of the most important goals to the city because it is the urbanization goal. It really tells us where, how, when we grow, what we need to grow. It's where we do our view on population, those types of things. So those are really the 14 goals that we deal with. Um, and I'm kind of shifting now from chapter two into chapter three. Those goals are all accounted for in our comprehensive plan. So if you go to the website and you look at where our comprehensive plan is, it's not a very robust comprehensive plan. Um, it's probably robust enough, but when we update it, we're gonna add some more meat to it. We're certainly gonna update it from the perspective of the era. I mean, it was adopted in 2003. And while there've been a few minor changes to it since that time, it's really still a 2003 document. And so it's over 20 years old. And there's a number of those goals when you read it, you can really see that it's aged. And in some cases, it doesn't really matter a whole lot. And in some cases, it matters a lot that it is not current and it's not giving us current information. The comprehensive plan is where we set our policies. 
So when we when we think about housing, there the current comprehensive plan really looks at housing through a 2003 lens. Um, and it doesn't really drive the city to think about doing things differently. It's like status quo is fine, 8,000 square foot lots. And, um, you know, we only want multifamily housing where we only want multifamily housing. And, you know, we want to downplay this and we don't want to allow that. Today, for our housing goals, um, we're going to see a lot of changes to those policy statements as we go through our housing needs analysis and some of the stuff we're dealing with with the missing middle housing fund and the housing summit that we had. So we really need to update the comprehensive plan, not only from the perspective of goal 10 and housing, but goal nine in our economic policies. Um, we probably need some better recreation goals for goal eight. Um, and then we need to look at, at goal 14 and how are we growing? And do we want to have a little more say in, in what is in our urban growth boundary or even beyond our urban growth boundary where we know we're going to reach out to and grow? Particularly the growth rate we're currently experiencing, um, we could consume our urban growth boundary fairly quickly um, and need to push out beyond where we currently are. And if we do that, where do we go? We can't go north. South becomes problematic pretty quickly, which means our direction of growth is east or west. Um, uh, so east, think Bombing Range Road. West, think Tower Road. Um, that's a big that's a big area, but that could be where I mean, if Boardman were fifty thousand people, where would Boardman be? That would be the footprint. So um, Boardman's not going to get there in five years. But what does 50 years look like for where Boardman is going to go? Think those, think those ways. Where, where does Boardman go? So that's kind of the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan is really your policies. You make findings and you set policy. And that's what you do in your comprehensive plan. You can also capture history in your comprehensive plan. So where were we? Where are we? And through your findings and policies, where do we want to go? And that's what your comprehensive plan document is really doing. It is your guidance. So again, all of these documents are reviewed by the planning commission, you make recommendations and the council adopts them because these are all either guidance or they're regulation. And in both cases, the council makes the final determination on what's adopted. So all those things you did last meeting, three of the four public hearings you had were legislative decisions that went in front of the council. And just so you know, they adopted all of them as presented. So. Um, some of the other documents that they talk about in here is they call it a zoning and a subdivision ordinance. For us, it's one document and it is a development code. So our development code has six basic chapters. Um, a number of months ago, back February-ish, we talked about the development code audit. Jamie, it might have been your first or second meeting. So you're probably going, yeah, maybe we talked about that. It was included in this packet too, so you have it again. Well, we've gone through our development code and we've got 14 pages of comments to it about what's working, what's not, what's missing, what's not flushed out. Here's a really good example. We allow mixed use development. Mixed use development is usually some kind of retail or commercial on a bottom floor or on the front and then and then residential uses on the second and third floor or behind. Well, we allow mixed use, but nowhere in our development code do we define what that means or how we do it. So we've had a couple of people come in and say, well, we'd like to do a mixed use. What, how do we accomplish that? And we can't answer that question. It's like, well, you know, it's going to have to go in for the planning commission. So I guess, tell us what you want to do. We'll figure out, you know, from a planning staff perspective, how to write a staff report around that. And we'll figure out how to get the planning commission to approve it. But we really don't have standards for it at this point in time. So those are the things that we've identified are missing in our de development code. And there's a lot of those all through the document. But our, our development code incorporates what's referred to in here as a zoning ordinance and a subdivision ordinance. And we have a combined development code that addresses all of that. So traditionally, a zoning code looks at what uses are allowed, um, what your zones might be, um, what your development standards are, what do you want to see in a house, what do you want to see in a commercial or industrial development, um, do you allow variances, how do you deal with non-conforming uses, and then the subdivision ordinance is, is just that, it's how do you how do you reconfigure lots. So you experienced that, Jamie, with your, your 
um, your kids, your daughter and son-in-law, when we had to realign because the house was mis misplaced and we had to look. So that was done by a replot. So that's that that's an action that falls under that subdivision part of a, of a development code. Just to put some context, maybe. Um, it goes through here and it talks about. Did it make it? Okay. What was that? So I, I just told her I cut a tree down, part of the tree down today that landed on their daughter's fence. Oops. Just a little bit. I mean, it didn't hurt it at all. It was just a small branch, but it was long. And then I had to do about it when it was blown. Yep. So typical land use actions, um, you know, they talk about the issuance of a building permit in here. And I, I think we have had enough, enough case law and enough conversation. We've tried to figure out how to make building permits a non-land use action. Um, the development permit that we issue is a land use action, is a land use decision. Um, but we issue variances, we do conditional use permits. So again, last month when we talked about the barbed wire on the county or on the city fences, that was a conditional use permit. Um, zone changes, you know, if somebody comes in and says, the zoning's not right for my land and I want to do this, um, okay, we can change the zoning on your land. Um, again, partitions and subdivisions. So whether you've got a lot and you want to cut it in half or you've got five acres and you want to create a subdivision for homes, those are all in that category of partitions and subdivisions. So lots of different things that we do in the course of the day. Um, the, the document then goes into a little bit more detail on what some of these are. So it gets into, into some detail on what variances are. We could certainly talk about that. Um, some of you will remember a couple of years ago when I first started, we probably did three or four variances because, because the builders weren't paying, if they were building too fast and they weren't paying attention to where the foundations were relative to the pins. We, we attempted to fix that problem by saying we won't even let you get past the foundation inspection until you run a string line and we can go out there and measure that your foundation edge is at least seven feet from the string line. Um, we've, we've pretty much closed the door on those variances and I got kind of nasty with a couple of the developers because it's like, okay, this is your second or third one. Um, one of them, it was like the second one I had done, but at least two had been done with when Barry was here and we finally said, this isn't happening anymore. You're, we're not doing this again. You get it right when you're putting the house, when you're putting the foundation down, or, or we're gonna have a kind of Jesus moment here. I mean, you know, I was just tired of doing those variances. We nipped that in the bud. And I'm not saying that's never gonna happen again, but we certainly got kind of familiar with variances. And that was really kind of pushing what the variance standard really allows. If you can't meet the stand, you know, that's a standard that you should be meeting because you are building at that point in time. Oftentimes variances happen because there's truly something in the code that is going to restrict you from developing and it's only applicable to your property. Like maybe there's a wetland and you're trying to mitigate how you do something around it. Or or maybe there's a maybe there's a historic tree. And I say historic more from the perspective of it's just a beautiful old oak tree and you, you want to preserve it. Okay, how do we do that? Now, those are the things that we should be looking at for variances, not because you put the house in the wrong darn place. Yes, I don't know if this question would even be on that topic, but what happens when, like a HOAs, where you purchase the house, the HOA state, the houses that are in that development have to be a certain size and certain things have to be done. So, so good question. And that we've had some folks call about um, Promay Homes recently. Yeah. So uh, we don't have that um, CCR on file here. It doesn't appear they ever, the original um, developer ever submitted that to the city. It was a requirement of their permit and doesn't look like it was ever submitted. Um, that's now trade changed hands. Um, the original developer has sold these last 40-ish lots. Um, so we're gonna try to go back and say, hey, that was never submitted, can you submit it? But, but we don't enforce HOA, we don't enforce CCRs. So CCRs are not a function of zoning or development code. If a subdivision wants to have CCRs, we don't say yes or no. That is the developer's prerogative um, and how it's established is up to that developer. If, if he, and I say he generically, if they have established standards around house sizes or anything else, 
it is it is the residents and their responsibility to enforce those CCRs. So um, that often comes up. Um, folks want the city to enforce CCRs. They're not our law. They are the community's law and it is up to the community to enforce it. Mm -hmm. So if there's something that's not happening in a community and there's a problem under the requirements of the HOA, so one that regularly, I, you know, you regularly hear this one. Well, we don't allow garish paint in our, under our HOA. Well, for starters, what's garish paint? <laughs> okay, so when you write those things, you should be clear on what you're asking for. You know, we don't want bright purple and pink houses. Okay, or we want houses in neutral tones. Well, give me a little more of the neutral tones, but, you know, make a de definition that people understand. Um, and then when the, the house isn't, done that way, then it's the responsibility of the adjoining property owners to say, hey, here's the CCRs. You can't paint that house hot pink and bright purple. It's got to be neutral tones. Yeah. So as much as people would like the city to get involved, not our law. We have we have no we have no authority there. Yeah. Yeah. Um variances. I'm gonna flip so conditional use permits. We did a conditional use permit. We've done two of them here recently. We did the barbed wire. We did another one recently too. I don't remember what the other one was. Um, but conditional use permits are things that usually have additional impacts than maybe other uses in that zone. So it's kind of like, why do we require a conditional use permit for barbed wire outside of an industrial zone? It's because we really don't want barbed wire outside of an industrial zone. We don't really don't want barbed wire in a residential zone. And if it's there, there should be a clear reason for why you're installing barbed wire in a residential zone. You know, kids and dogs and chickens and, you know, things happen. Uh, limbs fall over fences and, you know, it's one thing to fall over a fence, but if it gets tangled in the barbed wire, now what do we do? So um, conditional use permits are usually, they have additional factors that you wanna look at more closely for why you're, why you're allowing it or, or approving it. And it might have standards associated with it of why you would add to that. So I just finished a staff report for the city of Stanfield for a um, freight, uh, freight facility and because of the number of trips, it's an allowed use in their light industrial zone, but they have a caveat that says that if, if a uh, facility in the light industrial zone goes over a certain number of trips based on a traffic impact study, that it triggers a conditional use permit. So it's like, okay, so we can't just approve this as a building in, on the light industrial zone. We have to actually look at this more strictly from the, from the we have to add those conditional use permit standards and look at those and look at the impacts um, through that, not only the lens of just the regular permit process, but we add the lens of the conditional use permit. So it, it's just, again, a higher level, a higher level review. Zone map amendments, we haven't done any of those here in my time, uh, but we're gonna start. So I'm just giving you a heads up. Um, we've got two or three places where we know we wanna make some changes to the zoning. Uh, both the map and possibly the ordinance as well relative to the use districts themselves. Um, two of them uh, I'll just share. So there is this one use zone in the commercial um, chapter that's called the BPA transmission easement. And it's designed to kind of define what uses would be under the, the BPA lines. But where it's been applied, it actually extends beyond the boundary of the easements, but it only goes like two blocks. It's like, well, why doesn't it go from one end of town to the other end of town under all the BPA line? So we want to amend that use, the description of what's allowed under that. We're basically going to only allow green space and walking paths and the things that we want to encourage under that BPA line. And then we're going to change the map so we map the entire easement from one side of town to the other so that we know where we're going to do those kinds of activities. That's one. And then I have yet to figure out how they approve the Sage Center, the Neal Early Learning Center, and the Rec Center 
on the property the way it's zoned. It's zoned for general industrial uses. Now you'll notice I did not list the Workforce Development Center. I can actually make a clear connection from the Workforce Development Center to the general industrial zone because the general industrial zone actually called out the allowance for a use that deals with workforce training. But those other three activities, there's nothing in there. And I can't, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. So we're gonna change the zoning on that strip of property there on the east side of Olson. We also don't have a use zone that really would account for those kinds of activities. So we're gonna create a new use zone and we're gonna we're gonna make so we're gonna we're gonna add new new language to some place in our development code and we're gonna change the map to make it make more sense. And hopefully whatever kind of zone we define might make sense other places too. And maybe there'll be other places we want to apply it. I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's a public facility zone um, and that would make sense. And then we could come in and, and change city hall and the schools, um, that kind of thing. And, and I'm, not, I'm not convinced we need to change city hall and the schools because traditionally government buildings, schools are allowed in most commercial and, and residential zones. Schools are allowed in a residential zone. The schools are in residential zones. So I don't know that we need to change the schools. City Hall was approved on commercial land and government buildings are usually approved on commercial land. Um, but I, I don't know if where those three, those four buildings are. I don't know if that's appropriate for that to be zoned commercial. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not saying it is or it isn't. It's just not right the way it is. And so we, I want to work to fix those things over time. So that's what this whole zoning map amendments is about. And this focuses on maps, um, but it's also about the text. How do you change the text? Um, and of course, we have a lot of changes we want and need to make to the text over time. Um, but there's some things on the map that we want to change as well. So we just did a real simple text change when we made some changes to the commercial district. So you've kind of seen how that sausage is being made. So, yeah. Um, it does talk about notice in here to DLCD at 45 days. That statutorily has changed. We now can do that in 35 days thanks to email and electronic platforms and those types of things. Chapter 8 talks about comprehensive plan map amendments. Um, we do not have a real clear delineation with our zoning map about comprehensive plan designations. So again, you think about your, of your comprehensive plan as a guidance document, and you think about your development code as your regulation. So you set your policy here, and then you set your regulation to conform to your policy. You kind of do the same thing with your map. You On your map, you go, well, we think residential should be here, and this is a good place for commercial and you want we want industry a little bit further away because we don't want conflicts between industrial land and, and, and residential land and maybe we should put a commercial buffer between them so you kind of have these platitudes that you do with your comprehensive plan map then you go in and you apply the distinct zoning most communities have moved to what they what they call a combined map where they'll have residential as a comprehensive plan designation, and then their zoning designations might be R1, R2, and R3, and that it's just the higher density, the further down, you, the bigger the number, the more density you have. In Boardman, it's currently residential, and then we have a multifamily designation, and we have a manufactured home designation, and we have a future urban designation. Same thing on the commercial side. You say, well, this is where we think we want commercial, and then in the city, we have tourist commercial, we have rural, we have service center, we have commercial, tourist, commercial, service center. Oh, the BPA transmission line one is actually in the commercial district. Um, but then we have some places that are actually mapped. Again, going back to the, the map, whether it be a comprehensive plan or zoning map, on the zoning map, we have a place that's, that's, that's mapped as open space. We have no zoning designation for an open space. So we've got something mapped, it's where the city shop and all the collector wells and all that stuff is. It's owned by Army Corps. It's mapped as public. But we have no corresponding language to tell us what that means or what you can do in there. And then you look at the marina park. It's not zoned at all. And that's federal land. And while we can't tell the feds what to do through the zoning ordinance, we can tell local state 
leasers of that land. So we can regulate what the park district does on that land. We do have that authority, but it's not currently zoned. So it doesn't have a, a zoning designation on it. And again, even if it did, we don't have any language to guide what we would want to see happen in those areas. And I'm not saying we need to do these things because I don't want George to do some things, but I want him to have clear authority to do what he is doing. In some respects, it's protecting him under the zoning code as much as it is providing providing kind of the parameters or the guidance. Jump in any time if you want to add anything. You're doing a great job. Okay. Um, chapter nine talks about partitions and subdiv subdivisions. We've talked a little bit about that. You know, the, the replat to adjust the property line that fits into this. Um, this is, I want to, partitions are when you create up to three lots and that's the, that's the remainder and two new. Subdivision is when you have four lots or more. Um, some communities delineate between a minor partition, a major partition and a subdivision and actually have kind of standards for, for, par for parcelization that's between four and eight lots. So our code just looks at partitions and subdivisions. So that's something as we go through and do the development code update, we can further think about that and refine that and what do we really want and what would the standards be and how do we account for that? Um, chapter 10 gets into other, flood, other land use considerations. Here they talk about non-conforming uses. That happens when you've got something that was built and it's been there since before the development code. It's a pre-existing non-conforming use. What do you do with it? And in most cases, you allow it to continue, but if they come in and want to make an improvement that's more than 50% of its value or size or space, you can't allow it because they have to conform with the code. So if you've got a house and you just want to keep the house and you don't make a whole lot of changes to that house, you can live in that house. Um, but if it's... Um, if it's a non-conforming use, like let's say it's a little shop and we've added residential land and now it's a little shop that's all, all surrounded by residences, you can maintain that as long as not much changes with it. But if you want to make changes to it, you then have to conform to the code, which means you're probably not going to have your shop anymore. You need to convert that to a house. Um, floodplain, we don't have a lot of floodplain in Boardman. They talk about in here about overlay zones. You don't I shouldn't say you don't encounter overlay zones in cities. The, the current county planning director likes overlay zones. I'm not a big fan of overlay zones. Um, so I'm not going to talk about them. And then land use compatibility statements. <laughs> we can talk about them if you want to, but it's just um, land use compatibility statements. Um, so one of the interesting things about Oregon land use is that when it was established, the state basically said to all of the other natural resource agencies, by the way, counties are your local land use coordinating agency and you other state agencies that do natural resources work, like Oregon Water Resources Department, DEQ, Water Resources Department, DEQ, <laughs> Doug Ami, yes, which is Department of Geology and Mineral and, uh, and Industry. Anyway, there's about nine or ten natural aid, natural resource agencies. DSL is one, um, Department of State Lands, so the removal fill permit process. Oregon Water Resources Department. Yeah. So what it's what the there's this this law that said SAC State Agency Coordination, and it says to these to natural resources agencies. You have to adopt a, a coordinating program and DLCD or LCDC, the Land Conservation Development Commission, is required to adopt that and actually provide, provide oversight to other state agencies coordination and counties are the coordinating entity for, for regions. So basically there's 36 coordination regions in the state. But we do Luxus here too. So if somebody's doing a project, so Amazon, has those big generators, right? And they go off periodically, they test them once a week, every two weeks. Um, and then they go off or they go on, I should say, when there's power outage or something happens along those lines. Those have an air quality permit. And so to get that air quality permit, they have to come to the local planning jurisdiction, whether that be for the one here in town, us, or for the ones in the county, to the county planning department and say, we want to apply for this air quality permit, but we're required to get local planning sign off that this use is allowed. And that's really all we're saying. 
we're saying on the land use compatibility statement that yes, that use is allowed. So we had a we've had a couple of things happen with the, the Amazon site inside the city limits where they've been trying to get an additional permit from a state agency and they've added something and they didn't come through us to actually get a development review permit for that new thing they put out there. So we'll hold them up with their state agency permit until they actually go through an approval process for that addition to their, their campus, whether it be the gas tanks to feed the new type of uh, generators they're trying to do or whatever it may be. There's been a number of things um, that happen along those lines. That's probably the one site that I've done the most Lux is on. There's been a few that we've done for Lamb Weston with their rebuild. Um, usually for most people in the county, you do more land use compatibility statements for houses. In fact, you do one for every house because in the county, every house has to get an on-site septic system permit. And to do that, you get that from DEQ. So you're not gonna get that DEQ permit until you get a development permit for the house, which is then going to allow you to take that development permit, go get your, because that's when the, the county will sign the lux, and you can go to DEQ and get your on-site septic system. So, say, and even if you're adding a bedroom to it, so it doesn't even have to be a new house in that, right. in that case. Yeah, if you're changing the calculation and they have to review your current on-site septic system, yeah, that'll happen. So that, those are, lot, we call them LUXs, land use compatibility statements. Um, chapter 12 in here gets into types of hearings. So last last month, we had one quasi-judicial hearing and we had three legislative hearings. Chapter 11. Chapter, did I say? 12. You said oh, chapter 11, sorry, types of public hearings. So legislative hearings, last month, the first hearing we had was a conditional use permit and that's a quasi-judicial hearing, which this talks about on the next page. But the other three hearings we had were all legislative and that's they're legislative because we're making law and the planning commission makes a recommendation that then goes forward to the city council or at the county it would be the planning commission making a recommendation to the board of commissioners so as we move forward with some of our all these updates we're doing so like our tsp when we adopt that, we're going to want the county to co-adopt that. So we're actually going to have to also work with the county planning director to go through their planning commission and their board of commissioners to co-adopt our TSP. Now, usually when a jurisdiction is co-adopting something, there is less opportunity for them to have input or to make changes we're really the body who's going to scrutinize it because it's our TSP. Same thing if they were to have something they, they wanted us to co-adopt, we probably wouldn't be scrutinizing it for input. It's kind of like when we adopted those three transportation transit documents, we didn't want to change the documents because they weren't ours to change, but we wanted them to inform our TSP process. That's kind of the, the different types. Quasi-judicial. So quasi-judicial is you all applying the current law. So a couple of things to think about. When you're applying the current law, that's the role. You don't get to change the law. You don't get to say, well, I don't like that law, so I don't want to apply it. You're applying the current law, and that's why we do a staff report, and that's why we say these are the standards, and this is how they meet or don't meet the standards, and if they don't meet the standards, they can if they meet these conditions. So um, if you remember the hotel on the other side of the freeway, they came in with a traffic count that was a bit funky for us. And we had a lot of conversation about the difference between a resort hotel and a business hotel, because the business hotel has a different average daily trip that gets accounted to it. And they actually did not trigger the need to do a traffic impact study. And when we put a condition on there that said, okay, we'll accept that, but because they didn't do a full traffic impact study, we really don't know what their, their trip generation letter said is that they don't have enough trips to actually <laughs> trigger necessary mitigation. <laughs> I guess we're not moving enough. <laughs> There's a light switch inside that door.
No, but it's still a little, a little bit green. There we go. Did we just move it up or did you find a switch? No, I found the switch. Okay, thank you. So, um, so we added a condition to that hotel that said, if it's identified that your trips are more than whatever that number was or whatever the trigger number would be, we may require you to do a full traffic impact study. And if that traffic impact study determines that there needs to be mitigation, you could be held accountable to that. So that's how we apply a condition of approval where we think that they were they were they they're not meeting a standard or we're concerned about how they might meet a standard. So an, another example might be if a hotel ha proposes a restaurant as a component of that, restaurants and hotels are allowed in the tourist commercial zone. We don't get to say we don't we don't want you to have a hotel because we don't want you to compete with the hotels or the restaurants nearby. If a restaurant is allowed, we can we can have a conversation about how it's permitted, but we cannot not permit it because it's a use allowed. So again, we're applying the law. Now, if you decide you don't want to allow restaurants in a certain place, then that's about determining in the development code where you allow restaurants and where you don't allow restaurants. But we can't selectively allow restaurants. If a restaurant is allowed based on the development code or a hotel or, you know, again, part of the reason I added retail to the commercial zone, to the church commercial zone, is it's currently not called out. And it's like, why would we not allow? We already allow, we're allowing retail functions in our tourist commercial zone, but it's not called out as an allowed use. So that's why we added it. That's also why we scratched or converted from we allow truck stops to we don't allow truck stops because we know it won't work in the tourist commercial zone at the main street interchange. So it's about applying the law. And so if the law has been established and uses are allowed, and there are standards how you allow those, then that's what we apply. And that's what you're seeing in that staff report. So the staff report is, is really telling you what the applicable standards are and how we think as staff that the applicant conforms with those standards. So we have building height standards, we have lot coverage standards, we have setback requirements. Those are all things that we can apply um, to say that's it conforms. And if something doesn't conform, then it, would a variance allow it? Is there is there something unique to the property that would allow a variance to say, okay, you can cite that a little differently, but we can't say if it's a use that's identified as an allowed use, we can't say no to that. So just I just that had come up recently. There was a discussion and 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 that had come up. And so I just I wanted I want to be clear about what the Kind of the role is and what our what our what the operating rules are that that we that we function from. The staff reports that we write are basically findings. So in in the law that we all deal with that is land use, we are required to adopt findings. So let's say something comes before you and Maybe we haven't, I'm trying to think of an example of when we've done this. I, I'm not coming up with one, but let's just say somebody wanted to put a, a widget factory in and it's in the light industrial zone. And maybe the standard isn't real clear about whether or not we can do that widget factory or not. And so we just kind of write the findings generically. We don't, at the end of the findings, we don't say planning staff recommend approval. If they meet these conditions, we think they can comply and we would encourage you to approve this. Maybe we write that real generically and say, you know, they, they're they not, there's some things they're complying, not, not able to comply with, and we're not seeing a way to condition it. And 29 people show up here and they say they really want that because they want the jobs. So when you're debating it and you come to a decision to approve it, we didn't write findings to approve it. We didn't necessarily write findings to deny it. We remained neutral. So in that situation, 
we need you as the decision-making body to have a robust conversation and tell us why you think it should be approved. And then we will capture that information in the findings document and we'll probably bring it back to you next month for you to approve it and for the chair to sign it. Now, those 29 people might come in and say, that's the worst dang idea we've ever heard and we don't want you to approve it. And they're gonna tell you all the reasons why. And when you deliberate, you need to make sure we're hearing you. And the reason you're denying it is because of odor. And again, we're starting from the place that they don't really fit. We, we're, not, we're not saying no. We're saying you could probably get to yes. You could probably get to no. But we want that input and we want your decision making, we want your deliberation to guide us where we need to go. That's a situation that's different than apartments are allowed in multifamily. And, and I get that maybe somebody doesn't like the apartment in multifamily, but that's where they're proposed to go. And we need to figure out how we get to yes on that. <clears throat> so it's 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 how we apply the law how we apply the law. That's that quasi-judicial. And that's really your guys' job. And I know sometimes you feel like we're just rubber stamping these. And I get that because when it comes through and it's a lot of use and we're looking at not so much can you do it, but how you do it, I know that can feel like we're just rubber stamping it. Um, but there might come a point in time when there's a real debate around the how. And we need you to help us resolve those conflicts that may appear around the how. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Okay. So that's how the Amazon got here. Because it wasn't a yes or a no, it was everybody's discussion you know, about it. Jennifer, I wish I knew more about how that process I, happened. I don't either. That's why I was just asking. Because I, yeah, that was a shock, I think, for a lot of people. Like, whoa, here's an Amazon in the middle of town. How did that happen? How did that happen? I will tell you that from my perspective, when I was the planning director at the county, it kind of surprised me too. Um, and we don't have to get into, you know. But but the, the, you're saying though that was a quasi judicial thing that, that, that essentially got it there to start with because so it wasn't a yes or a no for it. It was just kind of here's some land we want to develop. Right. So the zone change would have been a legislative action. So the zone, the change in zoning to zone that, I think it is general industrial on the map now. Um, and it used to be half of it was residential and half of it was future urban, I think. And so the decision that went through you guys, although not you guys, because I don't know who was on the planning commission then, I, maybe none of you. I, I, well, I know several of you weren't on the planning commission then. What would have come in front of you would have been a change in zoning. You would have had a, it would have been a legislative action. You would have made a recommendation to the city council. Um, and then the city council would approve that zoning. Um, the, the actual use of the building should have been under the current development code, should have come in front of this body. And I don't think it did. Now, any appeal period has long since passed on that. Right. But um, I will tell you that when, um, now, neither one of us worked at the county anymore, but when the, the public works director at the time and I found out about it, by the time we really knew what had happened, it, the issue was they wanted access off of Olson Road, which is a county road, and they needed an address. And the city had issued an address that was a city address. And we said the county, that's a county access point. We need to have a conversation about who should be addressing that city or county. And by the way, why has nobody talked to us about the fact that there is going to be an access and how many cars a day are gonna come down Olson, which is a poorly, it's a super highway now, mm -hmm. but it was a poorly constructed, poorly maintained county road. I'll just share that the planning director and the public works director at the county at the time were not happy people. And we we went back and challenged the planning official here at the time, the community development director, on why we were not noticed because we were in a joining jurisdiction. And that was not adequately answered. So um, 
that's why we're trying to do it right now. Because I think there were a lot of things historically that didn't happen correctly. And so the reason you guys are seeing more robust staff reports, why we're actually asking you to the chair to sign things, those are because we're trying to implement better process and procedures to better document the decisions that are being made. And that shift from very used to just sign a zoning permit to authorize these things to where we are today has been an interesting transition. And we've tried to do it in such a way that we're stair-stepping people to understand that it should have always been done, it should have always been done this way, and it wasn't. And we're trying to bring you along in incremental steps until we get there. Um, but yeah, there have been a lot of changes in the last two and a half years for those reasons. For those reasons. So yeah. Yeah. So quasi judicial hearings. Um I, I, the finance piece I think is really important. And nine times out of ten, maybe 90 times out of a hundred. The findings that we give you in a staff report are probably adequate. They're probably adequate to the decision. But if there's any modifications that you want to make, if there's a condition you want to add, if there's testimony and you're kind of like, you know, do we have any room? Do we have any room to deal with the testimony here? And we have that conversation and there is, then we need robust conversation so we understand why you're adding that condition or why you've gone from approval to denial or whatever that is, because we're going to have to draft findings that support your final decision. And if there's any risk of that decision being appealed, we want to make sure that our record is solid and that the record reflects the law that would be applicable and the reasons for the final decision that you make. Because we can inform, again, we can inform 90 out of your 100 of your decisions adequately. It's when those exceptions happen that we need that additional conversation. We need that. We need you guys to be communicating with when, when you move into deliberation or when you have the opportunity to ask us or the applicant questions. If there's something you want to know about, that's your opportunity. And that's when you should say, well, Mr. Smith, can you help me understand why, why you're asking for this? Um, if Mr. Smith is the applicant, it might be Mr. Mr. Brown, who is in opposition. Mr. Brown, can you help me understand, based on the criteria, why you're opposed to this? And again, take it back to the criteria. What is it in the criteria that you think, if you're in opposition, why you think they can't comply? Because again, you can't say no just because you don't like it. If it's a use allowed, and you're trying to figure out how to maneuver that through that, that place, then you need to ask those questions and you need to get those answers. And you need to feel comfortable in it. And if I'm sitting over here going, check out my facial expression. Because if you're going down a rabbit hole, I want you to know. <laughs> but ask questions. You know, try to find that place where you're getting that information and feeling comfortable with the answers you're getting, whether it's from the opposition, the support, or the applicant, if they're here. Get try to get that out of them. Um, sometimes it's hard to get people to talk, and you want them to tell. In fact, I'll tell you at the counter, people come in and they will say, "Well, I think we want to do a. I think we want to do a doggy park." Oh, okay. Well, what kind of doggy park are you thinking about? Well, you know, we want to allow dogs to come out and have a place to play and do these things. Okay. What well, is this going to be open to the public? Well, well, no, no, it's not really going to be open to the public. Oh, okay. So are these dogs going to just come for an hour and go, or are they staying longer? Well, no, no, they, they might even stay overnight. <laughs> oh, so you want a doggy park that dogs can come and stay for 24 hours? Well, well, well maybe. Okay, so where are the dogs gonna stay when they come to your doggy park? Well, we're gonna build a building and we're gonna have rooms in it for the dogs. So they're really trying to do a kennel. Absolutely. Getting... But, but they've learned that if they come in and ask me for a kennel, I'm going to say we don't authorize kennels. So they think if they come in and ask for a dog park that they can build a kennel. 
and only get an approval for a doggy park. But as you are able to talk them through that conversation, you get to the, well, no, you really want a kennel. And I don't have a mechanism to prove a kennel. Now that's when you have the conversation about, well, maybe the conversation we need to be having is less about you wanting a doggy kennel, but what you need to do to be able to get to a doggy kennel. And what you need to do to get to a doggy kennel is have a conversation about, can we change the text of our development code? Is that a use we could add? Now there's other problems with doggy kennels. And what it's, if it's the doggy Airbnb? <laughs> I think it's still a kennel. You sound like the person <laughs> at the counter now. Right? <laughs> yeah. I like you know, being able to you know, <laughs> see. They should totally do that. Better dog yeah. Airbnbs. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we all need a dog sitter. Well, you're doing you know. dog. Yeah, because that would be their argument. But it's not a kennel. It's not a kennel. <laughs> right. It's not a kennel. <laughs> They're just doggy sitting. Yes. Airbnb. Yes. It's good. You should do that. <laughs> So there's a couple of things in this chapter about um, actually running running meetings. So um, I'm going to kind of hit hit the high points here. So um, we do a pretty good job on running our public hearings. I think Jacob Kane was a really good chair for the time he was here. I think Zach is really growing into the role of chair. He and I have talked a number of times about you know how, how am I doing, and you know we kind of talk about it a little bit. Um, it can be daunting to be sitting in the middle chair. I get that. I think the night Sam did it. <laughs> Careful, you might find yourself <laughs> chair. Um, you know, the night Sam did it, I think he stepped in and did a pretty good job of that, having really never done it before. Um, but but it is about, I think that I think the tough part about being a chair is that your lesson is decision making role. When you're sitting in that middle chair, you're really less making a decision. And you're more running the meeting. And I think it's really important. And I go back to the conversation we were having about robust findings and making sure the findings fit the decision. I think the role of the chair is really about making sure that the people out here are heard. Nine times out of 10, and maybe 99 out of 100, when somebody comes to a, to a public hearing, they want to be heard. And even if the decision goes against them, if they feel like they've been heard, they'll walk out of here and be okay. Now, not every time, because clearly Mr. Hattenhauer walked out of here and wasn't happy. How did that end up with the city council? What, what? They appealed it. The the light, the hawk light. Oh, it's been appealed by Mr. Hattenhauer. And who's he? The owner of the Sinclair. The owner of the Sinclair. And because that is an ongoing action, I'm not going to say anything more than. That's an example of where he didn't get what he wanted here. So he's appealed that your decision, because that was a quasi-judicial hearing, you made the final decision. Oh, that's the other CUP we've done this year. We've done that CUP and we did the, the barbed wire CUP. Um, he didn't like your decision. He's appealed that to the city council. So we're in that appeal process with the city council. He didn't want the light. I thought that was a pretty good... Compromise. I think it was the right turn in, the right turn out. Uh, so to... again, it's in process. So yes, I'm going to ask good. us to not have that conversation because okay. it's still in process. Yes. So then, um, so again, a decision you make, and just like a decision I render. So uh, type two decisions, when we do notice to join property owners and we approve something because the code says we can do that, the standards are... We, we seek comment to make sure we're applying the standards adequately. Those decisions, if somebody comments to that and they don't like the final decision that I render as the planning official, they can appeal that decision to you. So there are occasions where you serve as an appeal body. Usually it's your decisions that are appealed to the city council. And we went through a rash of those over the past four or five years. I mean, I wrapped up several appeals on the loop roads and some things over in the Port of Moral Interchange. Now we've got the appeal on the light. So public notice, um, we provide public notice for all these. Um, this particular chapter here is a little out of date relative to the statute. Some of these timelines are a little bit different because statute has changed, um, but there are some requirements that we provide notice. Um, we provide notice based on our development code uh, when we're required to provide notice to anybody within 250 of the feet, 250 feet of the property boundary where the proposed action is taking place. 
So that, that's kind of what we do with notice. Um, a bunch of definitions in here. And then there's some exhibits, there's some sample orders and decisions. Again, these are, this is a dated document. It's almost 20 years old. So we, we do these types of things in a much more robust um, way today. Um, we also do most of our applications on our citizen serve um, online platform for how people um, apply. And then they in here, they also have uh, 197763. And I'm not so sure that this piece of statute hasn't changed as well. Um, and then there's an exhibit to planning documents. It's talking about things you can go find at DLCD or maybe at local jurisdictions. If you go to the DLCD website today, they probably have 75 different documents that you can look at. This is one of them, this whole document. You can go and find on their website. And there's a bunch of others. If you really wanted to get into all of this, you could really, there's a lot to learn. Um, and I've just thrown an awful lot at you. Any questions, any thoughts? No, I think, well, not sorry, not something like, um, I think this is really, really helpful, but I think that where I'm going to get the most knowledge is actually going through some of the actual. The yeah, I, I would encourage you to re take this home, read through it. I mean, it's it's good on insomnia. Um, well, maybe like when the, when something's coming to um, a, a hearing or something's coming up, maybe you even just give us an email that says, hey, remember that chapter we read on, or, you know, chapter nine, or look through that. That's going to be really right. helpful. To get that background information for him to be right that and then we and i know like, oh shit, this is going to be you know on the very end so it's going to be on a so yeah so like i said earlier as we were talking through these things we have a number of things that we're going to be bringing to you over the next several months you know some zone text changes some zone map changes mm -hmm. um and as those happen um i'm hoping that we can continue to kind of build the education um, at the front end and through the process so you can kind of see that. Um, I think the council is not used to this stuff either. So they kind of have a learning curve that I think they're trying to. And then again, remember, I shared with you a while back kind of the work plan for all of the things we're going to be doing over the next two years. So I'm going to ask right now as we're as we're in this conversation, the one thing that we're about ready to kick off and we need to populate a public advisory committee for, and I'm actually going to ask for two of them. We're doing our TSP update. I'm going to ask for three of them. We're doing our TSP update. We have that contractor selected. We're doing our economic opportunities analysis and that contractor has been selected. And we're doing our parks master plan and that contractor has been selected. I would like a planning commission member to sit on each of those public advisory committees. Those would probably be late afternoon meetings um, because there will be a mix of agencies, business owners, and then we're going to want a city council member and we're going to want a planning commission member on each of these. I'm not asking for one of you to do all of them. I want you to share the workload. So to that end, the TSP is about a 12 to 15 month project. The EOA is probably a nine month project, eight to nine month project, and the Parks Master Plan is a nine month project. Um, I think the public advisory committees on the TSP, there's four of them. What is TSP? Transportation System Plan. So for the Transportation System Plan, the TSP, I think there are four or five public advisory committee meetings for the ELA, there might be three. And for the parks master plan, there might be four. So I'm basically asking you if you have an interest in one of those things to commit to three to five meetings and a fair amount of reading over the next nine to 15 months. I'll do the park one. Anybody want to want the TSP? Anybody want to joust him for the for the parks one? No. What's the middle one? The EOA, the economic opportunities analysis. That's really looking at employment lands. So commercial and industrial. So who, Dave, you said TSP? TSP. Anybody want to joust David for the TSP? Nope. Okay, everybody's gonna give that to you. And then Mike, you said parks. the parks.
Are we looking at also, I know I talked to Brendan before about um, possibly taking another look at the IM. We'll do that after the TSP. Because the TSP we have to do first in the IM, yep. right? Okay. Yep, we'll do the TSP first. Hopefully we'll get some good data, some good guidance out of the TSP that will drive the the, the next update to the IMP. Okay. Yep. I am semi interested in the EOA. Okay. But I'm just nervous because my plate's so full as a principal and there's so many things I'm doing on that. I don't know what kind of time commitment. So it's it's just several meetings. So I think in the EOA there are three or four public advisory committee meetings. Um there's probably four documents that should be three. Each of those documents are the the appendices of those documents can get to be long. Um, but they're also tedious and maybe not, they would not be, they would be more informative to somebody who was more of a subject matter expert. It's the, it's the memorandum part that you would really be looking at. Um, I, I would say that if you want to challenge yourself around what you do here, any of these, and there's going to be more. These are the first three. We also have an HNA that will eventually get engaged with, with that housing needs analysis, and then we'll eventually have an update to both the development code and the comprehensive plan. So there's like seven different plans, which means that there's seven planning commissioners, you could each take one, and, and none of you would be committed to more than one. It's just a matter of, you know, between the seven of you and two of you aren't here tonight, you know, what do you think you want to take on? What what do you what are you thinking about? So yeah, I don't think I'm a good EOU one. <laughs> the other two, um, the, the especially the housing, that one's very so I'm gonna I'm just gonna make a note here for HNA and Jamie, I'm gonna go ahead and, and tag you then on the HNA. It would be the same thing, it'd be three or four meetings, four four documents over. And get emails will be sent to when meetings are with documents. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. The contractor is required to provide those meeting material meeting materials seven to ten days prior to a meeting. Um, you'll get those things um maybe directly from them, more likely from me. Um, I'll be the project manager for all of these things that are happening. So um yeah. So we need somebody for the EOA. I'll do it. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm kind of the same same with her. I mean, I have a lot on my plate, but I think I can. Yeah. And it's only three or four meetings. <laughs> and and it'll be over. It'll be over like nine months. The EOA time frame is eight or nine months. So there'll be a kickoff meeting that'll be pretty simple. It'll be introductions. It'll kind of inform you of what's going on. Um, and then there will be there'll be uh, two meetings kind of in the middle of the process where you'll be looking at the interim products. So kind of the, the memorandums where they're talking about employment land needs. And um, I can't remember what the titles of, the, of those technical memorandums are. And then you'll be looking at the draft EOA. Uh, at the conclusion of all of these, there will be a joint work session between the planning commission and the city council um, to review that, that, final draft and then whatever comes out of that work session they will then create the draft oh they'll, they'll you'll see the draft and then you'll see the you'll see as the planning commission the final draft that any final fine tuning happens here and then you will recommend it to the city council to adopt the exception to that process will be the parks master plan because we're actually doing that collaboratively with the parks district so when we do the joint work session, it would be Planning Commission, City Council, and the Parks Board. But all the rest of them are just city documents that we'll be adopting. So again, also on that list will be the Boardman Development Code um, and the Comprehensive Plan. Those are being done, we're trying to source those to be done by a single contractor. It may be that we ask two of you to participate on that particular group because we're probably gonna combine those. Um, I just don't want to create quorum issues with any of these and get four of you on any of them. So, um, you know, having one or two, that's that's good. Because we right. don't have so to... uh, what, if we're on these committees, when it actually comes here, then we have to step away. Nope. 
No, nope. absolutely not, because okay. these are all legislative decisions. Okay. Um, so you can be fully engaged, fully engaged there, fully engaged here. And in fact, your your other commissioners are going to look to you to say, you know, if you have a concern with something that came out of that and, and you don't feel it's been fully resolved, that, that that's your voice. Carla, then I may not be able to, because I'm, when that whole... But the, the TSP, the TSP is a citywide document. Okay, so I can still do it because I'm when when the whole decision happens. But I'm the gonna... South Main Street oh. conversation is going to happen alongside the TSP <laughs> conversation okay. because the South Main discussion is really an application of the current IAMP. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure there's no conflict of interest there. Yeah, and, and I would say that if you find yourself in that position, please reach out and let's talk about it because I don't think you'll have one. Yeah. I mean, I think when we get... So <clears throat> the other thing is that the 7th Main Street Project is a project that is identified... I think it may be identified in the current TSP and it's certainly uh, delineated in the IAMP. So we unlike the light... Okay, so I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the light, but the reason the light project came to you is because it's not delineated specifically in the TSP or the IAMP. And so our development code says it has to be approved by a conditional use permit. That's why it came here. If they were putting in the lights at the off ramps, if ODOT was doing the light project at the off ramps, those are authorized in the IAMP, it would have never come before you because it's a project authorized in a planning document. But because the light at Boardman and Maine is not envisioned or authorized, we had to bring it before the Planning Commission to authorize it. So South Maine is envisioned in the IAMP. So when we implement the IAMP requirements and we do the design of South Main Street, part of the reason we also took out in the downtown development plan when we took out that that thing that shows the walking path going down the middle of the street, that that is also applicable to South Main because that's a city preferred alternative when you build South Main. So we wanted to remove that walking path down the middle. But the downtown development plan, to some degree, is applicable to South Main Street in a better way now because we took that city alternative out. But the IMP is also applicable to South Main Street. So it's already envisioned or authorized in a planning document. Yeah. Yeah, any other questions on any of that front? I don't know about you guys, but we're gonna be really busy over the next two years. So none of you can resign because <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna train you up, okay? And and then we're gonna give you a lot of training and learning through all of this process, and then you can't quit for 10 years mm -hmm. because you guys are gonna have an intimate knowledge of everything that's gonna have been adopted, and you just have to stay here. We'll see. <laughs> The other thing I gave you, and I, I want to be cognizant of time because we're already almost at 7.30. I also threw back at you that I didn't know how much time we would take tonight. I also in the packet threw back at you the audit that we did on the development code. And again, you guys don't read the development code. I don't know how much this will, will mean to you, but you can take this audit document and go on the web and open up our development code. And you could read through the current development code chapters and look at what we've said here in the audit and go, that makes sense, that doesn't make sense. I'm not saying you need to do that, and I'm not even encouraging you to do that. But if you wanted to have a better understanding about where we're coming from, with what our concerns are with the development code, this is a good place to start. Um, what I will tell you is this, that this audit will be significantly augmented over the next, particularly over the next nine months as we do the TSP, the EOA, the PMP, and hopefully we get to the HNA because we want all of those additional inputs. So when we are doing the update to the Boardman Development Code, we've got input from the consultant that's doing the housing needs analysis. How should we be changing our residential standards? When we do the employment lands, um, the economic opportunities analysis, how should we be better managing our our you know, is there different standards we should have for employment lands, whether it be commercial lands or industrial lands? 
um, what are current standards today? We know they're a lot different than they were 20 years ago. What are those kind of best practices and what do we need to do to our development code? Um, I think the TSP is going to inform us about projects and what we need to do. And we'll be that will be informing to some degree our, our development code and our comp plan. It'll also be informing our capital improvement um, plan. In fact, all of these will be informing our capital improvement plan, parks and TSP in particular, what do we need to add to our inventory over time? We've got parks with no playground equipment. We've got parks with no lights. We've got parks with no parking. You know, what do we need to be doing to make these parks more attractive and more useful? So, um, and then we provided in the agenda. And again, we'll solve those email issues. I know some of you didn't get the email for tonight. So we'll solve those email issues. Um, we did provide a link to the development code, but you can just go to the, the website, find community development. And when you get to the community development page, if you just push the plus button on the first item there, it'll open up and give you all of the current planning documents. You can go take a look at any of them. So, all right, I'm I'm gonna say there's no public for com public comment, which gets us to commission comments. So Mike, I'll let you, um, See if your your folks have anything to say. Any no. You sure? I'm good. No comments. Which means you. So we can adjourn. So I, just one second. It, it does say future meetings September 19th and October 17th. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to be in South Dakota in October. Um, so if I can manage it at all, we may cancel the October meeting. Um, we don't have any applications yet for September. So um, there's still a couple of days left. Um, I won't be at the October 17th. So no no Dave on October 17th. Yeah, sorry. Um calendar, there we go. No, that's a calculator, not the calendar. We're at five weeks right now. We're at five weeks today. Yeah, we don't have, I don't think there's anything in the queue. I will confirm that, but at this point in time, it looks like there may not be a September 19 meeting, but I will confirm that this next week and let you know if it's a canceled meeting. The caveat is, is you guys want to do another round of training in September if there's not a meeting? No, let's hold off on that one because that's going to yeah. be around my anniversary. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I'll be able to make a September one, depending on where it is. So I'd rather not as well. Okay, so um, I'm just going to say here, no meeting with a question mark. And I, again, I don't think we've got anything in the hopper. So I think that's probably going to be canceled. And then again, I'm not saying October will be canceled. I, I just may be promoting it. I may be somewhere between here in South Dakota and Stephanie and whoever we hire to replace Nancy may be running the show and I'll be on Zoom. If I can remote it, I might be able to run the room. Right. I mean, we have Zoom. We have a platform. So it's not like we have to be here in the room. I like to be here in the room because I like to see your, 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 I like to see your smiling faces because I can read the them that are here than from there. <laughs> so, all right. I, I think that's all I have on future meetings. So I'll let you adjourn the meeting. Cool. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good job, Mike. You did a great job, right?